Good morning, everybody. It's time to begin our class this morning. <laughs> Hate to interrupt all the good conversations going on. If you want to be opening your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that's where we're going to pick up in our study. And just a reminder that the upper room is always available. If anybody desires a time of, of prayer that's available, please make use of that. So I thought this morning, instead of uh, summarizing the letter so far, which has been done really well the past few weeks by the other teachers, they've done an excellent job on that, I thought I would just review just real quickly just some of the, uh, just some of the soul-nurturing thoughts that we've covered in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is so rich, right? There's so much in here for us to meditate on and think about. And Like I'm thinking of chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, where Paul says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. You know, does that, does that affect the way that we look at the church? You know, the word he uses there for temple means the inner sanctuary, right? The holy of holies. That's where God's Spirit dwells. And I know the church is made up of imperfect people, and we get frustrated sometimes with the church, but it's still nevertheless true that the church belongs to God, and His Spirit inhabits His people. And we need to treat the church and interact with the church with that truth in mind, right? He says earlier in that same chapter, verses uh, 10 through 12 of chapter 3, that everyone needs to take care how they build upon the foundation of Christ, right? And I know that certainly applies to teachers and to preachers and to leaders, but, but everybody affects the, the church, right? Just by you being in it, you have an influence on the church. You influence other people in the church. And we need to all look at ourselves and say, what kind of impact am I having on the Lord's church? What kind of attitudes and actions do I foster, right? Am I kind of a divisive person? Do I kind of divide the church up between us and them? Or am I, a, am I a peacemaker? Am I a reconciler? Do I bring people together? Right? Do I just constantly and vocally and openly just criticize everything and everybody about the church? Right? Or am I someone who tries to, to build up the church and shows respect for its leadership and tries to cover faults? You know? um, so all of us, I think, need to be careful about how we affect the Lord's church. Right? He says, take heed. Uh, chapter 4, verse 3, this is a verse that I've been thinking about a lot recently. You know, Paul's such a picture of Christian maturity. He says, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. I think for most of us it's a very big thing what other people think about us, right? People's criticism with us just consumes us, right? Because I think we're too concerned with the opinions of men as opposed to being concerned only with the opinion of God, right? I mean, there is great freedom whenever you truly live your life just to please God. And you're actually free from being enslaved and trying to make everybody else happy and enslaved to the opinions of men, which I think is where we are so many times. Verse 7, Paul says, For who makes you differ from one another? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You know, I think if that truth really becomes a part of our outlook, that's really the way we think about things, that's the end of pride. That's the end of envy. That's the end of prejudice, right? Since everything that everybody has is truly a gift from God, there is no reason to feel superior. There's no reason to feel inferior, right? What right do we have to question how God distributes his gifts? All we need to concern ourselves with is our own accountability for what he's given to us, right? But yet, how many of us truly think that way, even though that is a truth plainly taught here? So, so much rich material in 1 Corinthians just for us to think about and meditate on. Um, but like I say, our text for today is chapter 6. We're going to look at the first 11 verses, and I'll go ahead and read that for us. And then we'll kind of come back and look at it in some detail. But the first question I'm going to ask you after I read it, so be thinking about this, is I want you to tell me what Paul's mood is, what his tone is, what what he must be feeling when he writes this section for us. So beginning in verse 1, he says, Dare any of you, having a matter against his neighbor, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Don't you know that we will judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have to judge things pertaining to this life, 
Do you set them to judge who are of no account in the assembly? I say this to move you to shame. Isn't there even one wise man among you who would be able to decide between his brothers? But brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Therefore, it is already, and some translations will say an utter failure or a complete loss. This one says, already a defect in you that you have lawsuits one with another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? No, but you yourselves do wrong and defraud, and that against your brothers. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor extortionists will inherit God's kingdom. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So listening to those words, what do you think is Paul's mood as he, as he writes this section to the Corinthians? Gordon? We had a case But they did come to you guys for a decision, it sounds like, right? Rather than taking it to the courts. Okay. Does he sound upset to you? Does he sound indignant or outraged or frustrated? Do you think any of those? I mean, those are the words that come to my mind when I hear him talking, right? Why, why would we say that? Well, the way it starts... In, in, the, in the Greek, that, to start with that verb dare, any of you, that has, that has the meaning of the gall, right? The gall of a person to actually do this, uh, to take a fellow brother to court. And just the rapid fire questions, right? It's just question after question after question at the beginning. Um, rhetorical questions, uh, I think, just show that he's, that he's frustrated with the situation, right? And so why, why should Paul be upset? I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, even in their culture, lawsuits were a part of everyday life just like they are for us, right? So what's the big deal? They're not taking the law into their own hands. I mean, is it? Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Good. Great. It makes me think of the, the mindset of the kingdom of God and the mindset of being in the body of Christ in the mm. church and how that governance within the church is superior to the governance of the world. Mm. Uh, it is, and it is set apart from the governance of the world. Uh, and we, we don't think like that. Right. Very well. Uh, we, we're more like the Corinthians, you know, hey, I'll, I'll take you for it. And really thinking that that's all it. He says, no, that don't solve it. In fact, unbelievers have no knowledge of the wisdom of God and the way of God. And you go before them to get instruction, what are you doing? Right. Uh, mm. That whole concept of who is the judge and who would you trust as judge is not someone who knows mm. Christ. Yes. Who is the judge? Very good. Very good. Yes, sir. So the, the flow here is, it ties both the chapter before and after. He's, he's about to answer a bunch of questions that they've sent him about marriage. And, he, and so chapter 5 is, before we can even get into your questions, there's a huge problem that you have here. And you should be able to take care of this yourself. But not only can you not take care of it yourself, you're actually taking yourselves to court. And so it, it's just, good. It's, building on trying to get to answering the questions, but he's just saying this is there, there's two levels of this that you need to figure out before you start getting into some of the preferential questions that they're about to. But yes. He's really frustrated because he feels like he, he can't even get to addressing the questions because there, there's monster stuff in the box mm. in the way it works. Good. Good. Yes. Also, sometimes the walls of the land 
Mm -hmm. True. Yes. 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 Penny. Good. reason maybe that we don't view this problem as as a big deal like Paul obviously does is maybe because we don't view the church like Paul does right we don't see the spiritual significance of it as God's temple as a holy place if we if we really viewed the church the way Paul does we would be outraged by this just like he is so the fact that our emotional reaction to it is different than Paul's probably reflects poorly on us because we don't really view the church uh, as we should but his questions that he follows up with really reveal specifically what's just aggravating him so much right Verses 2 through 4 where he says, you know, uh, don't you know? Don't you know? It's like you, you have so little self-understanding of, of who you are as the church and what the future holds for you. That seem, doesn't, doesn't seem to impact the way you behave at all, right? Do you not realize the dignity that you have in the Lord by being part of his church and the position and the role you're going to play in the end times? Uh, he goes on in verse 6, and he's frustrated because it, it disrupts the unity of the body and the witness of the church, right? And those two things are, are linked. Right? Jesus said, all people will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. So when you're destroying the unity within the body, you're destroying the effective witness of, of the church as a witness to God's love in the world. What kind of witness does the church have to God's love in the world when its members are fighting out in, out in public like that? Right? Um, and we'll see at the end here where he talks about those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right? It's, just, it's a denial of the power of the gospel in our lives, that we've been changed, that we're different people now, yet we're reverting back to the same kind of values and those same kind of attitudes. What do we know about the nature of the litigation in this case and about, just about their court system in that day? Do we know anything at all about maybe what this case involved or their, what their courts were like? The term here, the, the, the words used, and this is speculation because we're not told specifically, but the terms here in this chapter make it sound like we're dealing with a, a civil matter, right? Not a criminal one uh, involving defrauding. He calls it trivial matters, things pertaining to this life. Um, the emphasis on greed and cheating that shows up in the later verses makes us think this probably involves material possessions or property or money. And if that's the case, it may involve members who actually had property or money. So it's possible they were more wealthy members in the congregation, possibly even leaders. Again, that's speculation. But we know, too, that in those days, the judgment seat for the civil magistrate was in the, the marketplace, right? It's out in the open. So when you're out there arguing with each other, it's like doing it in the market, marketplace. Everybody can see it. Everybody knows. This is a very public uh, demonstration of the, the contention and the strife between you. And we do know that, of course, you know, their, their judicial system wasn't, wasn't perfect. It was uh, subject to, to bribery and corruption. Uh, James, James says as much, right? In James 2, he says, you have dishonored the poor 
Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? So the idea that the rich would be likely to use this because they held the upper hand, right? Because of their influence, because of their wealth, they were more likely to prevail in the court system. So they would more likely be the one to make use of it in a case like this. So let's kind of look here at some of the verses more specifically. In verse 1, uh, Paul refers to the pagan judges as the unrighteous. Why does he call them the unrighteous? Paul had first-hand experience. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Right. Yes. Going back to your bribery thing, what was one of the, I don't know, I can't remember who it was, which one, but it was way more right. Yeah. To let Paul go. Excellent. And that was the only reason that Paul was still there. Yes. He knew what Paul had, Paul had done anything, he should let him go, but he was waiting for a bribe. Excellent. So when you, when you first-hand experience something, especially in what was Paul doing the whole time, he was preaching because they were not saying. Yes, very good. Yeah, Danny's referring to that case in, when Paul was left in jail in, for two years in Caesarea by Felix. And the Bible tells you Felix was waiting for a bribe. He expected to receive a bribe, and he was just wanting to show the Jews a favor. Right, so that tells you a little bit about, about the system, right? And Felix is a higher up, so you don't expect much better for people under him in the, the lower courts. So, right, that's, that's exactly the case. Um, you know, first, I guess in the past when I've read this, I thought, of course, it could just mean they're, they're non-Christians, and that's, and that's possible, but unrighteous also means unjust, right? And it could reflect a, a untrustworthy, and it could be like a moral evaluation of the courts. Because just a few verses before, at the end of chapter 5, and verse 12, he, he talks about, what have I to do with judging outsiders, right? He could have used that language to describe someone who's outside of the church, but he's changed language from outsiders to the unrighteous. And unrighteous, this very same word gets used down in verse 9 to describe those who don't inherit the kingdom of God, right? That's the exact same word. So uh, I think it possibly does reflect, like Danny said, this is a moral evaluation of the system. And it just helps to highlight how ridiculous your situation is. You're going looking for justice from people who are unjust. That doesn't even make any sense, right? Stephen? And it's not just that, in, in Paul's world, he views himself as serving the king, Christ. He views those that are outside the church as serving the ruler of the power of the air. Mm. Good. Why are you going to Satan mm. to receive judgment for the people of God? Mm. Very good. Yeah. Very good. And yet, we know in Romans 13, he tells us to honor those in authority because God yes. sets them up. Yes. And God sets them up with a purpose. The purpose is to reward that which is good and punish that which is evil. That's their purpose. When they fail at their purpose, God will judge them. Uh, we don't have to do that ourselves. We just trust He will. But unrighteous judges eventually get punished for doing mm. unrighteous things. Good. Uh, it takes a while. You know, we like to see it happen for the Yes. And, that, and that's a great point to balance with because, because God's Word does not cheat, teach right that we despise pagan judges. That's, that's not in the Word because, like Greg said, in Romans 13, Paul says, the governing authorities, they are God's minister to execute wrath on evildoers. They've been given their authority and their position by God. And so we have to show all men the honor that's appropriate to them, right? So, Ernie, do you have a comment? I think this song speaks the love of the saints here. Because when I wrote the names, I already knew what it was going to be. Because I've been reading the Bible for many years. And I wrote it in song. I don't know you. And if we couldn't solve it, then we go to my father. told how to handle disputes and grievances between ourselves, right? Matthew 18, you've already spelled it out perfectly, right? There, there is a, there's a method that God has an approach for dealing with these kind of grievances, right? Um, thank you. Very good. Looking here at verses, uh, at verses 2 and 3, how, how is Paul reasoning with them about this? What does he appeal to in these verses to try to get to show them uh, the error of their ways? What does he say? Be a judge. 
Mm, excellent. Very good. Very good. You guys have, have nailed it. Um, right, he, he appeals to who they are in Christ, right? Their, their future role, their future honor as being parts of, part of the church. And that's not something they've realized yet, right? That's what living by faith is, right? You're certain about future realities that haven't happened yet, but you know they're going to. And because you know that, that affects the way you live and behave today. And that's what he's calling on them to do. Behave like people who understand this. Do you know who you are in Christ and the glory he has in store for you? Then, then act like it now, right? Um, is to me, is, is kind of the rationale that he's appealing to here, just to show them, you know, I think he's just trying to get them to see how ridiculous, right, their situation is, the, the absurdity of it, and to show them that they're, you know, they, they, and it's ironic because they perceive themselves as so wise and so spiritual and so elevated, and yet he's shown them the reality is, is, is just the opposite, you know. Um, Yes. Very good. Notice too, uh, in the in these verses, I mean, how does Paul describe the material concerns of this life? What's his wording there? Trivial cases in some terms, small matters, right? How can he say that? I mean, this could be property. This could be bucks. I mean, come on, Paul. <laughs> Are you that out of touch? This stuff does matter, right? How, how can you say this is trivial? This is, this is so small. Hmm. Small ultimately, right? Ultimately, ultimately, this is going to come to what in eternity? It's going to come to zero, right? Hmm. Yes. 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 Their values are just so messed up, right? They're so focused on the things that really are of no consequence. And the things that really matter, like the unity of the body and the glory of the Lord being demonstrated in his church to the community is of no concern to them, right? Um, and, it, and, you know, I, when I read that, it just strikes me that, you know, so much of the stuff that consumes us and that just occupies our time and our energies and our attention is stuff that's going to amount to absolutely nothing in, in eternity, right? And I'm in that boat. I feel like that way about myself, and I think... Um, I'm glad God's patient with us and, and gives us space to grow, but, uh, but we need to have his perspective and see, and see that this way, that these, these are things. And this, this valuing is going to rebuke, right, the eager plaintiff in this case, because Paul's just called his whole case stuff that's trivial, right? Um, Paul says in Philippians 3 that he considered everything a, lo a loss, right, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. It was rubbish, he said. Should not that be the effect on all of us? If we, if we truly come to know God, should we not realize that in God we have literally everything? And by comparison, anything in this life is, we, we can just sit loose to it, right? It doesn't have a hold on us because you have God. And if you have God, you have everything, right? And so this other stuff just doesn't matter. But Yet, for so many of us, it still matters. It's precious to us. It matters too much to us. And I think it just shows us maybe we don't, we don't know God like we, think, like we think we do. We know about God, but maybe we really haven't experienced to, to know what we have in God and to rejoice and find our contentment in Him. It, it makes me think about Jesus' parable about the two servants, the one that owed the master decades' worth of wages. And mm -hmm. then he 
was forgiven that. And that servant then had another fellow servant that owed him a few bucks. Mm -hmm. And he harshly treated that. And so this also makes me, this is also kind of a matter of judgment as well. Um, and if you're not willing to deal with your own brothers, brethren appropriately, you're also in danger of judgment of God. Mm -hmm. Good. Very good. Uh, verse verse 4, if you look at verse 4 in a few different translations, you'll see it's a little bit of a difficult verse um, to translate. Uh, I, I was just comparing the King James versus the ESV. In the King, in the King James, it's, it's a command. In the ESV, it's a question. In one, it, the, the judges are believers. In the other, they're non-believers. So even though, even though the idea of the entire passage is pretty clear, pe people struggle a little bit with, with how to handle um, this verse. Um, I personally don't think, you know, the, the word that's used here in, that's called the despised or those, um, how does this one, of no account, right? Paul doesn't use that kind of language to describe people outside the church, right, that he's trying to reach out to. He doesn't call them despised. He certainly doesn't use that kind of language to describe believers, right, especially all he's going to say in 1 Corinthians 12 about the, the mutual dignity and the respect that we need to have for each other in the body of Christ and for one not to think someone else is indispensable and we're not um, I think it's probably language like he used in, in chapter 1, verse 28, the kind of language that the world might use of Christians, seeing them as despised, or, you know, where, where it talks about God chose what was weak to shame what was strong. God chose the things that were despised, possibly in that, in that sense um, there. Verses uh, 5 and 6. So this is the first statement in this section. It's been question, 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 question. He gets to verse 5. This is the first statement. He says, I say this to your shame, or I say this to move you to shame. All right, we just saw back in chapter 4, verse 14, he was careful to say there when he was talking. He says, I don't write these things to shame you, right? but as my beloved children, I warn you. But now here in, in chapter 6, and later on in the, in the book, in chapter 15, he's going to say the same thing. I write this to your shame. Is there a legitimate place for shame in the Christian life? I think there is, right? I mean, we have here an inspired apostle <laughs> telling us that, right? So I think the, the answer is obviously yes. How, how so? Because I think in our culture and our time, people would say there isn't any place ever uh, for shame. That's kind of a more prevalent idea today, but yet this is biblical language. This is an inspired apostle speaking this way. So how, do we, how are we to, to take this or understand this? Shame is an appropriate response to guilt, right? 
And they're, when we cross the line, when we violated God's law, we should recognize we are guilty. And until we're not going to, like you said, we're not going to repent. We're not going to change until we recognize that. So try to tell people they should never feel like they're wrong is just denying that there's a standard that we are all accountable to before God. And when we cross the line, we are guilty and we should feel shame. He says as much in Romans, right? When he's talking about when you were in sin, right? And you were free from God. What, what fruit did you have in those things of which you are now ashamed? Like we even look back, as Christians, we look back on our past, the things we did, and we still feel shame for that. And I'm, that's not inappropriate at all. Yeah. Mm. Yes. which is their bad behavior in this case, so that they can do the right thing and avoid the shame that this would bring upon the church and everything mm. else. Yes. There's a great song that says that the shame of Jesus is so far like the beating blushed on his farm. You know, he sheds mm. a thing of light of mind that's been out of his whole mind. He ends by saying, shame of Jesus, yes, I may, but I have no guilt to wash away, no fear to avoid, no sin uh, to mm. forgive, no, no soul to save. But till then... <coughs> at uh, verse 6 here. How does verse 6 really help reveal the tragedy of this, of this whole situation? What, what does it point to about this situation that makes it even just more, uh, more tragic than the fact that they don't realize you know, who, who they are in Christ? And The first half of that verse, he uses the language brothers, right? Brother goes to law with brother, right? Using that familial language to show you're, you're, you're breaking up, you're destroying the family of God, right, by this action. And then when he says, and that before unbelievers, right, which we, we've talked about a little bit already, but this discredits their witness, right, their witness to God's love in the community. So that those are the elements that they're destroying, the family, the unity within the body, the witness of the church before the unsaved, um, really the damage done to the glory of God's name, Right. <clears throat> it's not mentioned in this text, but like we see, this idea of the church as the temple of God dominates Paul's perspective, right? And even though he hasn't said so much here, he said it earlier, and that's the way he thinks. And so this is bringing shame and reproach to the glory of God, right? Which is his chief and primary uh, concern. So all this helps us to see why the transition here to verse 7, what he's going to say in verse 7. So this is already an utter failure, right? This is already a complete loss. And what if he's, what, in view of what he's already said, I mean, this is, this is as bad as it gets. You know, for the Corinthians who were just so, life's all about winning and losing, and lawsuits are certainly about winning and losing, he's saying, look, this is a total loss regardless, regardless of the outcome or the decision in the court. This is just a complete loss already, right, for, for the reasons he's spelled out. And look at what he says here at the end of verse 7. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? Is he saying that with a straight face? How can he say that? Does that sound like anything else we've heard in Scripture? Yes. Turn the other cheek. Overcome evil with good. Right? He's already talked about the conduct of the apostles here in, in chapter 4, 1 Corinthians. He said, when reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, uh, we speak kindly. Right? Jesus has told us that we are to what? Take up our cross. Right? To follow him. Right? Really, he's bringing the moral implications of the cross to bear on their situation. Right? Yeah, you should have gone to your brothers, but you know what? There's something even better than that. It would be even better if one of you understood uh, the wisdom of the cross enough to know that, you know what? That doesn't matter. You can have it. Whatever it is, it's yours. We're brothers. Right? You think of Abraham. Remember Abraham's contention with Lot in Genesis chapter 13? The herdsmen were fighting because they both were so rich and the land couldn't support them both. And Abraham, got, Abraham learned, right? There's this contention. And he goes to Lot and he says, don't let there be any strife between you and me or between our herdsmen because we're brothers, right? And you remember, he as the older statesman, he, he says, look over the land, take what you want. 
whatever direction you go, I'll go the opposite direction, right? And Lot had a great opportunity, right, to, to show reverence for Abraham and to say, no, no, you, you choose first, but instead he chose selfishly, right? He looked around, he saw what he thought looked the best, took it for himself. Did Abraham end up being a loser for that? Hardly, right? If you know the story, you know the way that played out. That, that God took care of Abraham, right? He did just fine. Lot ended up losing basically everything for a lot of reasons. But, I mean, just the way Abraham handled that, right? He yielded the first choice to his nephew and honored his word and took what was left. I mean, that was, he's just a picture for us of how to deal with these kind of disputes. Um, did I miss a hand here with someone else? So, like I said, refusing to seek redress, I think, is even better. It's even superior, right, than having Christians arbitrate just because it shows that we understand and we live by the wisdom of the cross. And we're willing to suffer unjustly and be okay with it. We don't always have to have our rights and have our way. We're okay with sacrificing because we follow a Messiah who gave up everything for us, right? And so, you know, I'll just use the public schools as an example, or some of the private schools even. When they want to push their uh, leftist agenda on my grandchild, I'm going to not stay silent. You can't change anything you do. Right. You cannot, uh, you cannot be silent and let them to put all that, it's unbelievable what's going on. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Yes. So, you have to be able to, uh, in truth and love, but in a firm way, say, this, I don't believe in this, and I want this book removed from the list, or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Do you not agree with that? I do. Here we're talking about contentions between two brothers in the church. Right. This is, this is internal house matters, how brothers deal with each other. Yeah. Which is a good point to bring up because people should not come away with this and say that Christians should never appear in court. That's not true. There, there are situations where it's very wise to make use of the court system. Uh, Paul did. And there are situations where you don't have a choice. Sometimes you're brought before. That's right. So that's a necessity. But right now we're talking specifically about the situation, two brothers at odds over stuff, it looks like, material stuff, how you go about resolving. But you're right. No, we ought to obey God rather than men. When, when that kind of stuff is going on, yeah, we should not be silent. Um, and if God commands us to speak, nobody else can tell us not to. Right? right? Yeah. So. so that's it in a nutshell. It doesn't matter if it's a right to speak or not. That's it's right. We're called to do. Right. There you go. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Justin. That's the point here, like we earlier. If you can't even agree to unify as a body, how can you expect to go out and peace the world and to preach the gospel? Good. Good. So he says here in verse 8, you know, but the Corinthians are so far from being willing to endure loss for the sake of a brother, for the unity of the body. They're so far from that. They're actually the ones doing the wrong. They're actually the ones defrauding, and they're doing that to their own brethren, right, within the church. That's how far removed they are from, from Jesus and his example at the cross, right? And really, this kind of unrepentant behavior... This is more than shameful, right? And that's what he's going to get to in verses 9 and 10. This is, this is as intolerable as the man with his father-in-law's wife, right? This, if this is unrepentant sin, this needs to be dealt with because this is behavior of people who are not even going to inherit the kingdom of God, right? So that's what he's going to get to here in verses 9 and 10. So he uses the word, or he says, do not be deceived. What are the Corinthians in danger of being deceived, deceived about? What's, what's his concern? To say that. Doesn't everybody know this? This list of evils, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God, isn't that? First grade level Christianity, what, why is he worried about people being deceived? Absolutely. And I don't know what it is about the, the human family or the human condition, but we are very prone, for whatever reason, to being deceived about the fact that God is going to deal with sin, right? 
What was the very first lie in the garden? You will not surely die. People still buy that lie today. You will not surely die. That's what we think. God tells us something's wrong. Well, you know, there's reasons why that really, that's not going to happen. Also, you, you, what you hear all the time, slowly but surely, after repetition, after repetition, becomes the truth to you. Mm. Uh, and so I think we, as Christians, are deceived many times by just who we surround ourselves with and who we listen to. Mm-hmm. Good. Good. Now, I love the fact, too, that, of course, now, if this was the end of our section, that's a pretty ominous way to end it, right? If he just stopped at verse 10, right, because even people who are saved still struggle with sin, right? And this is not saying anybody who struggles with sin. There's a difference between struggling with sin and just being unrepentant and giving yourself over to it, right? No remorse, no repentance. This is just what I'm going to do. Um, but look, he, instead, he ends with verse 11. And how does verse 11 change things? Such were some of you, but... But, but, so what, what does that verse tell you? I mean, to me, that's a profound way to end in this section. What is he saying? Mm. There is a right way. Mm-hmm. Because of God, you're better than this. Yes. Live up to who you already are, Right. In Christ. I would say this, friend. You know, we put on the name of Christ as a Christian, right? We represent Christ. Uh, our actions, the things that we say, are not just a reflection on us. It's a reflection on this church. Mm. It's a reflection on Christ Himself. And so I, I, you know, we're, we're not living in a little bubble where it's all about us. Mm. The things that we do and say is a bigger reflection that if we're aware of the name of Christ. I think we need to yes. be aware of that. We don't just represent ourselves. Yes. Very good. You know, I look at this section and I think Christians have been so graciously dealt with, right? These, we were guilty of these things, right? But we were washed and we were sanctified and we were justified, right? That our past doesn't define us anymore, thanks to God. We are, we are new. Um, there is a glorious future in store for us, like we've seen in these earlier verses. Things hard for us to even imagine, right? We'd like to know a lot more details about what he says there, but that's still the reality. That kind of role, that kind of dignity. Um, literally, he said earlier in chapter 3, literally all things are ours in Christ. right? So in view of such surpassing blessings as a Christian, can we not afford to be generous? Can we not afford to be open-handed in, in the things that are ultimately, like he says, trivial matters? Right. The property, the money, the little disputes that people want to argue about. No, that's mine. In view of what we've already got in Christ, can we not afford? Then we, we've been so graciously dealt with. Shouldn't we be very gracious in our dealings with others? Right? It's outrageous if that's not the case. Right? Because it shows we really don't understand what's been done for us if that's not the case. Right? <clears throat> His repeated use of the word but three times just emphasizes the break from our past. Right? Our past doesn't define us, <clears throat> thanks to God. <clears throat> Normally it does. Right? Normally, that's the reality. Apart from God, your past pretty much dictates that's, that's who you are. That's the way things are. But God, God doesn't just forgive us of our sins and then leave us in our sins. Right? God actually transforms us. Right? And, even if we, and even if we wrestle with past sins, which will happen you know, by the strength of God's spirit, we have the power to overcome right? if there's a desire to. <clears throat> and that list is pretty broad. Hmm. I think sometimes we, we think that we have the Yes. And very prevalent and very important. Yes. Very good. You know, I see here that, of course, Paul is God's spoken, spokesman here, right? He's sharing with us the mind of God on this matter. And he is he's upset with the whole church, right? Just like in chapter 5, yeah, he was upset with the man who was living with his father-in-law's wife, but he was upset with the whole church for doing nothing. And now here, yeah, he's upset with the litigants, but he's upset with the whole church, for doing nothing, basically. We're, we're the peacemakers, right? We're the, we're the reconcilers. We have obligations to each other. If, if we know of unrepentant sin going on in the church, or if we know of brothers and sisters who are just at odds and irreconcilable and have grievances, 
we have obligations to each other. We, we don't have, it's not just okay to look the other way and act like, oh, well, you know, whatever. Don't we know that we are the temple of God, right? And that's supposed to determine our outlook. And we see that his temple is holy. And that's something, that needs to be resolved and needs to be resolved by loving members of the body. And, and unfortunately, we can't just turn and walk away. I mean, I know in America, we like to be private and our own stuff as our own stuff. But in the church, you have obligations to each other now, right? And so I really see all through his letter that the corporate nature of the church and our, our responsibilities to each other as brothers and sisters is really dominant in this, in this letter. And so hopefully this just helps us think about as members of the body as we come together, the obligations that we have to each other, to, to build each other up, to help each other, to know enough about what's going on with each other that we can actually be, uh, be a help like God intends us to be. So that was the second bell. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer, please. Holy Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for your word, for the insight that you give us, for the portion of your, your mind that you share with us, Father. We pray that we recognize what a treasure this is and that we uh, give ourselves to the study and the meditation of your word. And we know, Father, that your word will not return to you empty. We pray that it will accomplish the things within us that you desire. And you would help us, Father, as, as your body, as the church of Jesus, to uh, to realize who we are as your temple, to realize the obligations of love that we owe to one another, and to learn, Father, from the mistakes of our brothers and sisters who have gone before us, and, and to be the people of God that you have called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.